Recently, there was a WHO, which is the World Health Organization, meeting, which was supposed to chart a path for the world to combat the coronavirus pandemic. But instead, it turned into something much, much bigger. Today, I'm going to prepare you for what is absolutely the escalation of a global breakdown, including the many power plays and attacks happening from multiple directions. As always, I'll break down the hidden truth behind the headlines and show you how to shield yourself from what's unfolding. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service, physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and even thrive through the crisis that everybody is now aware and getting tired of, quite honestly, but at least everybody knows that it is unfolding. And today we're going to do headline news because tonight I get to interview Jim Rogers and we're going to be running that tomorrow. But I want to start with this. Virus dispute overshadows health forum. A meeting of the World Health Organization that was supposed to chart a path for the world to combat the coronavirus pandemic instead on Monday turned into a showcase for the escalating tensions between China and the United States over the virus. President Xi Jinping of China announced at the start of the for forum that Beijing would donate $2 billion toward fighting the coronavirus and dispatch doctors and medical supplies to Africa and other countries in the developing world. And we're coming back to that in a minute. But the contribution to be spent over two years amounts to more than twice what the United States had been giving the Global Health Agency before President Trump cut off American funding last month. And it could catapult China to the forefront of international efforts to contain a disease that has claimed at least 315,000 lives. But it was also seen particularly by American officials as an attempt by China to forestall closer scrutiny of whether it hid information about the outbreak to the world. And, you know, I really have to tell you this, that in the 80s when I became a stockbroker, all I heard about was globalization, globalization, globalization. And I remember thinking to myself at that time that that was not going to be such a great thing because it was going to ship jobs overseas. This whole coronavirus pandemic has really shown us the holes in the supply chain system. And so what's really happening, and, and this, started, this started a couple of years ago, really, was deglobalization, which is messy, messy, messy. So they can point the fingers here and they can point the fingers there. But this is really just an escalation of the trend that was already in place. Further, vaccines, early test results, elevates hopes and stocks. Now, this was on Monday. You may have seen that the Dow climbed over 900 points. It was because of the vaccine's early test results and also Fed Chair Powell on 60 Minutes, which I was going to talk about tomorrow, but we're going to talk about on Monday, basically saying unlimited amount of new money that can be created. So with any excuse, any excuse to push stocks higher, traders did just that. They've got unlimited money backstopped by the Fed, backstopped by the government as well. So it's not just the Federal Reserve anymore, it's the government. So traders feel comfortable because they know they're going to be bailed out. But this headline on the same page right there, I love this. 
wary treasury may constrain the economy's rise. And in here, what they're talking about in this article is that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are, Department are not doing enough. Don't worry, they'll do more. They're telling you, unlimited, unlimited. It's just crazy. But the vaccine's early test results, the preliminary findings in the first eight people who each received two doses of the experimental vaccine must now be repeated in far larger tests in hundreds and then thousands of people to find out if the vaccine can work in the real world. You know, I mean, it's going to be at least, it won't, be, it won't happen this year. And it's going to be at least 18 months from what they're saying, 12 to 18 months before we might even have a viable drug. Now, personally, I don't intend to take the vaccine, but they're probably going to make it very, very challenging for us to live a normal life without doing that. So we're going to have to just wait and see what happens with that. But the other piece, going back to China, because... There are opportunities that are presenting, but I want to talk about this for a minute. So China lent billions to poor countries. We've talked about the Silk Road, where China went out to emerging markets and lent and lent and lent. But they didn't just do that for free. With each request, okay, as the coronavirus spread around the globe, Pakistan's foreign minister called his counterpart in Beijing last month with an urgent request. The country's economy was nosediving and the government needed to restructure billions of dollars in Chinese loans. And this is happening from all over the world in these emerging markets. Everybody's economy is shut down, so it's all diving. And just like we have something like 16% of, of Americans not being able to pay their mortgage and they're in forbearance. Okay, well, global governments want that too from Beijing. But there's a, well, I don't know if it's so much a, of a difference. We'll come back with that. But let's see. Over the last two decades, it unleashed a global lending spree from money they create from thin air and debt showering countries with hundreds of billions of dollars in an effort to expand its influence and become a political and economic superpower. Here's the piece. Borrowers, so these countries that, and these governments that are supposed to represent the public, the normal guy, put up ports, mines, and other crown jewels as collateral. Hmm. So just like borrowers that have a mortgage, if you do not pay your mortgage, guess what happens? You lose your collateral. You lose your house. So is that what's going to happen to these country crown jewels? Our ownership of them now going to transfer to China? Not just yet, just like the mortgages are in forbearance. And if, if the uh, lender is a government agency like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or Ginny Mae, 12 months they can be in forbearance. But you know, so this won't last. Maybe it will last as long. I don't know. But this is absolutely something to keep your eyes on and to pay attention to what happens to those crown jewels. Because it's part of the ITM strategy that, you know, quite honestly, I've studied currencies and, and cycle shifts since 1987, this is pretty typical. This is how wealth transfers. And I think that a lot of people that, that it was kind of hard for them to see a while ago how they were going to be able to buy that entire city block buildings and all for the equivalent of 25 ounces of gold or the equivalent. Well, maybe you can see that more now. I, I know that that's true in my family for some people that I had spoken to about this in the past, and I think they thought that I was all wet. But, you know, here's the reality of it. All of that real estate and commercial... Wait, wait, there was one more in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
commercial real estate. Now you got to pick and choose because the world is definitely shifting and we've have discovered, I mean, retail is a mess, but we work, we've talked about we work before. It never made any sense to me. You are leasing long and then as a corporation, as we work, and then chopping that up and leasing short term. It was a mismatch that drove the prices of commercial real estate up, but it just didn't ever make sense to me. WeWork, the office space giant that was struggling before the coronavirus shut down much of the economy, is asking landlords for a break on its huge rent bill as it tries to survive the pandemic. Okay, lots of companies, lots of large companies are doing just that. But here's where that little twist comes in. Some of the company's small business customers are also seeking relief on the rent that they owe. But they say WeWork has been unwilling to cut them much slack. The tension between WeWork, its landlord, and its customers highlights the problems gripping the market for office space. There's going to be a lot coming on the market. So when you're paying attention and you're looking around, you want to pick and choose absolutely necessary space. You know, this is true for states as well, but, and it's already been happening. I've highlighted that a few different times where if a state is in a fiscal bind, and let me tell you with the loss of the tax revenue and the fees, they're in a fiscal bind. They, may well have to sell some of their income producing crown jewels. So would you, if, what I'm looking at, I mean, you obviously get to do anything that you want, but what I'm looking at are things like by the Capitol where they have to have the Capitol building and then they have to have the parking around there, parking garages, something that is an absolute requirement that's what you want to own. Something that will generate income on the other side of this mess when we're inside of a new financial system and a new currency system, you know, but the gold will enable you to maintain that space. It is not yet time to buy it. I'll let you know when I start buying it and that's probably going to be a pretty good indication of when you should start buying it. But you can start looking now and thinking, gee, I'd really like to own that. I can say here in Phoenix, there has been so much building going on. Keep in mind that all of these commercial mortgages, well, the Fed is buying a whole bunch of them. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Are they going to end up owning empty malls? Well, maybe, except that it's you and me as taxpayers that are actually ultimately going to own those empty malls. That's not what you want, but you want to start paying attention to spaces that you think will maintain their value. Lots of building here in Phoenix, lots of heart apartments going up, condos going up. Chances are pretty good. A lot of that's going to be on the market and it's going to be a whole lot cheaper than it is right now. I know that you maybe have read reports that came out, one came out this morning, talking about how uh, people that were living in dense cities like New York City, they were using that as an example, have gone out to the suburbs and gone out even further and they're looking for the three P's they said. Um, and what were those three P's? I know one was a pool. <laughs> that was the last one. Property and, well, I'll say SPP because they wanted space. So that is happening, but they're buying it at a market top. And remember, now they do not have to do any appraisals for at least for 120 days. Not at least, but for 120 days. Anybody that's buying real estate right now, you got to have a place to live. You got to have a place to live and make your last stand. So I'm not talking about that. But anybody that's thinking about flying from the stock market into the real estate market is, in my opinion, nuts. 
because they're both severely overvalued and they will be coming down. They will, they have to. Okay. Now, remember we've been talking for a while now about the um, universal basic income and guaranteed income programs attract bipartisan support in Congress. There is the ACT program that is one of the things that they've been talking about and it's really interesting because it pays a base of $2,000 a month plus an additional $1,000 a month for any additional children or family members. I mean, you know, if you stop and think about it, you can make a very nice living on universal basic income, but only when that, those dollars buy you what they buy you today, which is a whole lot less than what it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, by design. So on the outside, doesn't this sound great, though taxpayers are responsible for it. Taxes have to go up, period, whether they're state taxes or they're federal taxes. Who's supposed to pay for all of this? And I know they're saying, oh, that not enough is done. That's nuts. It's an unlimited amount. That's nuts. And it's never going to be enough. Universal basic income. It's never going to be enough. But we are a consumer-driven economy. They got to enable people to consume. And with the unemployment expected to go to 25% or more, mm, they better give people money to spend. But the value of that money will, will be destroyed in a hyperinflationary event. There is not one little teeny weeny, itty bitty, teeny weeny doubt in my mind about what's coming. Here is, and this is part of the reason why, debt burden joins virus as a killer of retailers. Ya think? J. Crew and Neiman Marcus were each facing a host of issues before the coronavirus. So they want to blame everything on the coronavirus, but this was happening long before that. Even though it wasn't apparent to people, it should be apparent now. Uh, and uh, the coronavirus pandemic forced them to close their stores and eventually file for bankruptcy, including trouble adjusting to the rise of e-commerce and a lack of connection with a new generation of shoppers. But they also shared one increasingly common problem for retailers and many other entities and people uh, in dire straits, an enormous debt burden. Roughly $1.7 billion for J. Crew and almost $5 billion for Neiman Marcus. Now, this is the piece and why I'm bringing this up. Okay, like many other retailers, J. Crew and Neiman over the last decade, that's 10 years, that says, oh, the crisis, the last financial crisis. Okay, over the last decade, paid hundreds of, of millions of dollars in interest and fees to their new owners. We're talking about private equity and leveraged buyouts. Some of you that are my age might remember the corporate raiders back in the 80s where they would go into a company and, and really pull it apart and sell the parts because the only thing that matters to these guys is them making money. And so they, in effect, the new buyers loaded these entities up with so much debt, leaving little more than crumbs after private equity takes its cut. Well, guess what? That's happened over and over and over again. And private equity, I mean, you know, we've, we've got um, Masasan, in SoftBank that on debt borrowed to fund all of these startups like WeWork and Uber and a number of others that are all imploding that sharing economy where you just have like one owner. I mean, in my opinion, this is probably the best thing so far 
that's coming out of this is that that sharing economy is being destroyed because that was not a good thing. That was not a good thing where you have, it's kind of like uh, kings and queens and serfs. You know, there's no fairness there. But what a recession and what a depression does, it really makes it much more clear uh, the income inequality, the wealth inequality because the system is designed to have the wealth float that way and just have us not down here not complain about it there is one more thing and i'm sorry i didn't bring it up yeah with i want to bring it up with china okay because i heard about this this morning it is not law yet but by a unanimous vote in the senate any chinese companies that have not been audited for three years, which is pretty much all of them, or at least most of them. So therefore cannot disprove their connections to the, um, to the Chinese government will be delisted. Now, since it, it, since it garnered unanimous support in the Senate, it is probably going to pass, to be perfectly honest with you. Why does that matter to you? Well, if any of you listening still own stocks or your pension plans or your IRAs, etc., and if you have MSCI um, ETFs or products, remember it was just like, I think it was 2016 where they came out with a China fund. And so they put all of these Chinese stocks into this ETF. And if you're sitting on them and they get delisted, today, some of the key ones like Alibaba and Tencent, the last time I looked, so I don't know where it closed, but when I was looking earlier, they had only lost about one and a half to 2%. So that's not really all that much, but you've got to pay attention. So this would be your opportunity if you're holding them I mean, I don't, you do whatever you want, but consider yourself warned because you've got to know that this is going to impact you. And of course, if it's being held in a pension plan, there's really nothing that you can do about that. But I would find out if anything I'm holding is attached to Chinese stocks because you're in jeopardy. You know, I go back to this deglobalization between the U.S. and China as the world's leading economic powers. You do not want to be sitting on Chinese stocks. So, um, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions, but uh, and Andy Constanza asks, I only have nine ounces of gold and five pounds of junk silver and three 10 ounce bars. Lynette, how much trouble am I in? To be really honest with you, Andy, most of the people have zero or maybe they have a wedding band or something like that. So the more you have, the better position you're going to be in. But I will tell you that you are in a better position than, than most people. If you can accumulate more, do it because you know, I've been accumulating for a long time and I, and I want more, uh, but you are in a much better position than most other people. The other piece that you want to shore up is your food, your water, your security, and also your community and your shelter. So I think we'll get a little lull in here for a minute, maybe. And when we do, use that or even before we do. You know, I just had a conversation with Dustin Nemos and he's starting his small garden, you know, and I think that's great. I applaud it. He's renting and he's still going to do it and he needs to do it because no matter what's happening in the economy, we all need food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. The more you can do with that, so I don't know what else you've done, but look at where your holes were when we went into this crisis because the bigger one is coming up. So however you can fix that, fix it. 
fix it so that you can weather this storm. And John Alsager asks, can you explain if mortgages on forbearance for 12 months will be required to pay those 12 months at the end of the forbearance? You will not be required to pay them as a lump sum, if that's what you're asking me, but you will then be required to start making mortgage payments again. So it's kind of like a bit it's, 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 it's like a bit of a debt jubilee, but the debt is not evaporating. If you have a private borrower, well, then they may give you forbearance for three months, but then at the end of the three months, then that's a lump sum. But if it's a government agency that holds it like Fannie Mae or Freddie, Freddie Mac or Ginny Mae, it's not a lump sum at the end of the 12 months. They don't want the property back. And Jeremy Mitchell asks, Money Belt, why eight weeks away? I would like to know your thought process on expecting the reset to take place in eight weeks. I don't expect the reset to take place in eight weeks. So if I misspoke, please forgive me. What I expect to happen um, over, and I don't even know if it's eight weeks, but the extra that they're giving people in unemployment insurance, that 600 bucks a week or a month or whatever that is, that ends the end of August, I believe. And then the PPP ends the end of September. But I do not expect a reset to happen in eight weeks. We have not felt near enough pain, not near enough. Right now we're still dealing with the health part of it, but the next part of it that we're gonna have to deal with once all this forbearance and stuff goes away, well, that's the that's the uh, bankruptcies. We're going to see how many companies can actually reopen and rehire. I mean, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, expects a V-shaped recovery. So, oh, we crashed and we're just going to go right up. And when you look at the stock market, it's not quite a V. Well, it is in the NASDAQ, but you are looking at a V and that's from all of that money that they're pushing into the system. But I don't think we're going to have a V. I think we're going to have an L. We dumped and we're going to bounce around on the bottom, but we haven't hit the bottom yet. We haven't even marginally hit the bottom yet. I think we may see that this fall, but we'll see how much longer they're going to give forbearance, et cetera. So that's it for today. This morning, I interviewed with Dustin Nemos, and I think that's probably going to release tomorrow morning. Uh, also tonight, the legendary Jim Rogers. I'm so excited to talk to him. You know, we could talk the same language because we're, he's a little bit older than me, but we lived through a lot of the same things. And he's, you know, you see him on CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, and now Coffee with Lynette. So uh, at least at this point, we plan on running that tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but next week, I'm going to be in on the Silver Bullion TV and that's really exciting for me as well because it's over. They're over in Singapore and so is Jim. That's why we're doing it so late. But if you have questions about this or anything else, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. Don't forget to visit our blog. You have the links to all of these newspapers there. And of course, we're on Brighteon. And if you're concerned about the economy, if you want to safeguard your wealth before this next shoe drops, we have to feel a lot more pain before we will just automatically accept that reset. There is a link in the description below that you can call, you can click on it and set that schedule. If no time that is available works for you, call us at 888-696-4653 and we will schedule you to get with one of our strategy specialists. They all, you know, if you're, if you're working with them, you're working with me and you're executing the same strategy that I'm working with, just tweaked to your personal circumstances, goals, and what you have to work with. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. We'll let you know when we're going live. And keep in mind that financial shields 
are made of physical gold and silver. And until tomorrow, seriously, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.